Hey everyone, thanks so much for coming along for this webinar, focusing on Life Changes Trust Advisory Group. We're really happy you can join us. The advisory group has been a big part of all our lives and we're looking forward to sharing our stories of our work with you today. We're all quite busy, the now working or studying and changing the world, but we're proud of the advisory group and the difference it has made. So thanks again for being here and enjoying the show. Hi everyone, welcome to this afternoon's webinar. It's always tough to follow on from Simone, but I'll give it my best shot. I'm Carol Patrick, I'm the Director for the Young People with Care Experience Programme here at the Trust. I'm your Chair for this afternoon, so I'll keep us on track. We've got some fantastic content to share with you today. We're celebrating the Trust Advisory Group for the Young People's Programme and exploring the learning that's come from working alongside them for the past five years or so. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to all advisory group members, both past and present. The roots of the group go back to the very early days of the Trust. In 2014, we appointed two young advisors with care experience who took part in trustee meetings and supported the development of the programme. This showed our early commitment to genuine co-production and laid the foundations for the development of the advisory group, which formed then in 2016. Forming the group for us was a demonstration of our commitment to getting alongside young people so that they can be influential, build strong relationships and exercise their rights. We believe that people are experts by unique experience and that the voice of lived experience is the key to transformational change. The group members volunteer their time to advise the trust and work on specific funding projects and initiatives and the role has developed extensively since we first began this journey. Over the years, the group has become increasingly involved in the Trust's work. Our trustees have fully delegated the running of our individual grant schemes to the group, meaning that the group members have now awarded over £690,000 in funding to people with care experience across Scotland. But more than this, the advisory group have been centrally involved in all aspects of our work. This includes the design of funding initiatives, assessing proposals and making decisions on contracts for external evaluations, including the one carried out by Matter of Focus, which you'll be hearing about today. They've led events, they've delivered training and they've engaged with government. They've influenced the independent care review and they've changed us as people. We now see everything through a different lens. You'll hear more about their many achievements as we go through the afternoon. But before we start, just a few housekeeping points from me. This event's around an hour and a half long and it is being recorded. It will be on our website in a few days so you can share it with anyone who's missed it. We'll email everyone when it's available. We'd love you to join in, so please share any comments that you have with us in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. You'll see that in the chat there's a drop down menu. This gives you the option to share your comments with the panel or with everyone. It's great to share, so please remember to select the with everyone option. So let's crack on with this afternoon's webinar. We'll be hearing from some of the members of the advisory group and there'll be some reflections from trust staff on what it's been like to work alongside them. You'll also be hearing from Ian Kenji, who was a recipient of a My Choice, My Future award. And we'll be watching the world premiere of Side by Side, a truly brilliant film made by and about the advisory group. Many thanks to Media Co-op for working with our advisors to produce this film. More about that later. First up, we're going to explore some of the impact and learning from the independent evaluation of our advisory group, which was carried out by Matter of Focus. So I'm going to ask Sarah Morton and Helen Berry to join me on the screen. Hi both, it's great to have you with us today. I'll just hand over to you. Thanks, Carol. And hello everybody, it's really lovely to be here today. Um, I'm Sarah Morton from Matter of Focus and this is my colleague, Helen Berry. And 
We were selected by the advisory group through a robust uh, selection process to carry out this evaluation and also to work with the filmmakers um, that made the film that uh, shares the findings from the evaluation. Just to say a little bit about Matter of Focus, we're a purpose-led company and we're on a mission to help organizations understand and track the difference they make. We're not gonna talk in detail this morning about um, this the methods we use for the evaluation and you'll know that there's a full report a summary report and some case studies available from the life changes trust that go into that detail if you're interested in it what we are going to do instead is give you a sense of how we work and what's important to us in the way that we do our carry out our evaluation and some of the key areas of impact we set out to explore in this evaluation and then we're going to pick out a few golden threads in our learning that we'd like to shine a light on for today's session At Matter of Focus, we believe in working side by side with people to kind of to help them set out and understand how their work creates change. Um, and that meant, in this case, both with advisors and the staff team at Life Changes Trust. We use the headings that you see on the slide to provide a simple framework for exploring different journeys towards change. So the sort of change where um, it's really based on people, it's inspiring or educating or empowering people and numbers alone can't tell the story. We use these headings to set out what we call a contribution story, which creates a line of reasoning from the things that you do as an organisation or a project or initiative through to the longer term outcomes, what difference does it make? And then that story um, becomes a framework to shape and collect evidence and to refine the story and really uh, build the evidence behind it so we can show that it did happen and also really highlight the key elements of the change. We use this approach with all of our organisations, but in this case, it was to understand the work of the advisory group. And I'm going to move over, pass over to Helen to say more about that. Okay, so this slide um, provides a visualisation really of the different areas that we looked at as part of this evaluation. So it shows how the, the kind of methodology that Sarah was talking about was applied in this particular case. So we looked at three areas. Um, the looking in to the bottom left um, was the part of the work that faces inward. So this was about exploring the journey of the organisation. Um, the culture, the processes, the practices, as well as the personal and the professional journeys of the advisors and of staff members. Um, the looking out piece at the bottom right um, was really around um, how the work um, influenced the wider world of young people with care experience. And there were two ch main change mechanisms here. So one was around policy and practice influencing. And the other was the co-production of individual grants programs, um, which Carol mentioned earlier. Um, finally, we constructed a further contribution story almost on top of those, if you like, and we called that lifting up. So this was slightly higher level and more abstracted. Um, and we created this with the group, I should say, as well. And it was really a kind of learning piece. So it was bringing together what we had learned about co-production um, through this work in a way that would make it more shareable um, for other people taking forward similar work in other settings. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of an idea of the, the, the phases of this piece of work. So we've worked alongside um, people in this work for about 16 months, and we'll say a little bit more later about how we involve people. I think the fact that we had four years work um, to um, uh, reflect uh, back on has really helped um, to, to kind of make the work um, as rich as it was actually and it was really important. What I'd like to do now is to share a few reflections on some of the golden threads that Sarah mentioned. So these are the sort of threads that are woven through the story and help us to understand why things have played out in this particular way. And I'm going to do that by using a small selection of quotations. So we had some beautiful quotations as part of this work. And I think they really, you know, they speak so powerfully. OK, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about the looking in part of the work, which is where we map the journeys of staff members and advisors separately. 
Um, and something that was really interesting was that although we mapped these journeys separately, the, the journeys actually mirrored each other to a significant extent. So they showed how people might enter this sort of journey, this co-production, having to work through some initial anxieties and then coming to commit themselves fully as human beings to the process. And similarly, at the end of the journey, feeling part of, of some kind of movement for change, having been quite strongly influenced by this way of working. Both staff and advisors um, reported the profound impact of the work um, on themselves, both personally and professionally. Um, and there was this strong sense of enjoyment and pride that ran through. And I think you could see that in um, Simone's expression at the beginning in the film there. Um, and, and we just felt that we could sense that all of the way through this work. We could also see that although advisors arrived in the room because they had this lived experience of care at some point in their lives, in practice, they brought forward many identities and experiences and developed new ones. And their involvement went so far beyond that personal individual experience. Um, and I think that idea of bringing yourself as a whole human being, because the advisors brought themselves as whole human beings, it really encouraged staff to commit themselves more wholly as well. So it was quite an energizing force, I think. Um, something, I think what the, the, the quote on the slide is really getting to is, is this kind of power of um, not starting with the individual personal experience is something that was a, a real kind of jewel in the work was that it, it was forward looking, it was about it started out with what people could contribute and where they wanted to go as a group, um, rather than asking people to tell their story, um, which obviously happens so often um, in, in this field in particular, I think, but it really was this forward looking agenda. Um, I'd like to say just a little bit more about what we, they thought it took to develop this particular way of working. And again, the tone of the relationships. Um, I think something really important here was that there was space for the work to be genuinely shaped. There wasn't a set agenda at the start. Um, also, this was work with a very tangible and direct influence on other young people, particularly through the individual grants programs. And that, that was just so motivating for people to be involved in. Another important aspect of this work was the willingness to invest in the people. So that might be funding for development, training, paid work, um, where, where that was appropriate and where the role was, you know, it was a very particular um, role that was maybe comparable to what a paid team, team member might be doing. So there's a lot of reflection around what should be paid and what should be voluntary um, in this piece of work. Um, Overall, I would say we found good evidence that the, um, the investment and the opportunities that young people got from being part of this group did make a positive contribution in terms of their own individual personal outcomes. So a final couple of reflections on the relationships work that this work takes. Um, number one, it's not easy, especially at the outset. And I think the relative consistency of this group over time has been really important and just how productive they've been able to be. Um, it really does take time and investment to do this work well. A common mission is so important in carrying people through. And finally, um, I think as this slide indicates, um, we heard the sort of language that people used around the group um, using words like friendship, home, family, connection. Um, and that language really shines through this work. Um, you know, it was a group that people wanted to be part of and, and, and felt good in. And that was just such a sort of powerful, powerful force within the work. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of the, the outcomes for the advisors themselves. I'd like to say a little bit about outcomes for the organisation. Um, 
this is difficult, I think, because the whole point is to embed or integrate a way of working. So it then becomes quite difficult to call out the outcomes. However, qualitatively, we noted people consistently using language like integrated, enriching, grounding, the idea of a wider conversation, more creativity, more energy, a greater focus on what matters. Um, these sorts of words to capture the difference that the work makes. And I think as this slide suggests, um, this is a cultural thing and it's about having a culture of working that supports the co-production um, and that's just so important. I wanted to uh, briefly mention the wealth of external influencing work that the group has done. So this is the kind of looking out piece that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we pulled together five case studies, as, um, as Sarah mentioned, of external influencing work. So I, I would encourage people to look at those if you would like to find out more. But there were some overarching threads to these case studies. Um, together, I think they underline how impactful the advisors have been as advocates for care experience. And they also show how the work has contributed to the voice of lived experience in different ways and places. And they show how advisors have contributed to collective campaigns um, and system developments within the sector. Um, our own reflection was that actually this piece of work was really interesting because um, it made us think slightly differently about what influence means. So rather than thinking maybe so mechanistically around policy influence, say, that actually um, the individual voices in this, in this piece of work were just so strong and the individual advisors were so strong. And I think it really helps us to think about what it means to be personally impactful or influential in our interactions with others. And I think that's what's really captured in the quote here. Um, finally, I wanted to say something about how the advisors were involved in the evaluation and how we worked together. So as was mentioned earlier, um, they were um, involved in constructing the brief and interviewing us, assessing our application and so on. So I think that sort of set up a very particular way of working with the group. Um, this was another piece of work that was commissioned prior to COVID, but then took place during COVID. So it required a complete pivot for everyone who was involved. And I think it was a testament really to the quality of the relationships and the working practices in the group um, and the commitment of those involved that we were able to work and have some of the, the really deep conversations that we had actually as part of this piece of work. Um, and, and, and able to do that well um, within the evaluation. And I think, you know, the advisor's kind of involvement in things like analysing the data as well as sharing their experiences of the work um, really helped to add kind of depth and richness to, um, to the final reporting. I'm going to pass back to Sarah for some closing reflections. Thank you very much, Helen. And I hope that gave you a bit of a snapshot of the uh, project we've been doing. And it's been really fascinating to explore the way that the advisory group became such an integral part of the Life Changes Trust and the wide ranging impacts on the advisors themselves, but also staff and the sector. And for us uh, as evaluators, it's also very exciting to have a film made of our findings. So it can be communicated in lots of different ways. We're really pleased to be here to celebrate this work and to highlight the difference that bringing lived experience in when done well can make to people and to an organization, and in this case, to a wider sector. We'd like to really thank um, the advisors in particular for working alongside us, for being patient while we figured out how to do things in this very different virtual world, um, and also to everyone else who contributed to the work. And so I'm going to hand back to Carol now. Thank you. 
Big thanks to, uh, to Sarah and Helen there for their input. Matter Focus really got alongside the group for this evaluation, and the reports that they've produced are great tools for anyone who's interested in working more co-productively. Please do take a look at them when you have the chance. Whether you're a funder looking to involve people and communities more in your decision making, or an organisation looking to get alongside people with lived experience to design better services and supports, the learning in these reports is so valuable. So next, we're going to hear from some staff here at the Trust. From the very beginning, it's always been important that we had a dedicated staff role, a main point of contact for the advisory group, so that we could really build up that trust and relationship together. It's been a real partnership that's allowed us to walk beside the group members so we can learn and grow together. Katya O'Rakelly has played this role since 2017, and we're delighted to have her back at work today following maternity leave. So in true trust style, we're throwing Katya right in at the deep end, and I'm going to ask her and Mary Reid to join me on screen and share some of their reflections on working with the group. Welcome to you both. Right. And I'll just hand over to you. Thanks, Carol. Hi, Catriona. Hello. So in the evaluation, there's numerous mentions of this participation lead, and that is you. Um, and as Carol said, we're throwing you straight into the deep end. What are you, five hours back from that leave? And, and we're getting you on to a webinar. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. <laughs> I think it's helpful if we just start with an easy one. Um, so tell me a wee bit about your role and also the work that you do with the advisory group. Um, hi everyone, um, so my name is Katrina Kelly and I am Senior Evidence and Influencing Officer at the Trust. Um, I've been at the Trust for seven years now, I think, um, and as Carol mentioned, I took over working with the group in 2017. Um, so a wee bit about my role, um, I'm really lucky actually, it's an extremely varied role and it can be quite hard to kind of break this down, so I'll just give you a wee flavour of what my role has looked like over the past few years. Um, so day to day, my work with the group could involve anything from developing a new grants initiative, such as aspiration awards, to supporting them to write a presentation for a conference or an event, to supporting group members with their personal development, so looking at training courses, kind of identifying areas that they, they'd like to work on. Um, and obviously co-producing the individual grants initiatives with the group has been a major focus of my work over the past few years. And in this, I would include refining the way in which we all work together in the most efficient way. Um, as anyone who works in participation knows, things can change really quickly. And what works one day might not work the next. Um, so developing our own approach to that has been really important. Um, and just to touch on, I think the more hidden part of this work is a time you spend kind of building and maintaining relationships with group members. Um, and this I would include kind of making the phone calls just to check in, say hi, bombarding them with Facebook messages about meetings <laughs> and all the little things that are, are just really important. I think like sending birthday cards or congratulation cards when things are important ha things happen in their lives. Um, so although my work with the advisory group is a major part of my role. I also have other work that I'm involved with at the, at the trust. So I'd say that over the kind of the four years that I've been doing this work, that the time I've spent focused on the group fluctuates anywhere between 75% and 25% of my time. Um, and kind of reflecting back on that, I think this is, it, it changes depending on what stage the group is at such as our new members joining, our people leaving, what work we have on, and whether we're in the middle of developing something new, because obviously that's going to be more intensive, and what support I can provide based on the needs of the group, but also kind of balancing the other work that I have. Um, so hopefully that's a wee bit of a flavour. But I've been off on that leave since December, <laughs> and you've obviously taken on most of this, the work with the group. So what about you, Mary? <laughs> yeah, so I guess... My choice, my future, we were probably at that point when you left and they were looking yeah. at um, inclusion and how to kind of widen that. So there was quite a bit of work done on that, you know, with people like um, Lindsay and Emma at the Trust, but also with some partners like In Control Scotland and Aberlour and staff. So they, they did reach out to some new people for that grants initiative, which was great. Um, they've also been assessing and supporting the legacy initiatives that the Trust is developing before we finish up in March. And they've obviously been working alongside Matter of Focus and Media Co-op in the evaluation. 
um, which I think the evaluation, it, it does for me really explain the kind of depth and breadth of the work that, that we do together, you know, and the impact that it's had on all of us personally, but also in the organisation. What, what have been the big highlights for you, Catriona, then in, around this work? So hard to pick, um, but if, yeah, if I had to pick two, I think my first one would be kind of an early memory, and that was the group being invited to speak at the Association of Charitable Funders Conference down in London. Um, and I picked that because that was a real um, goal of the group. They really want to influence others. They want others doing this work. Um, they want to share what they've been doing. So I think being invited down to speak about our work with aspirational awards, that was a real win. Um, and I think it gave the group real encouragement for the work that they were doing because it's kind of right we're doing the right thing people are interested in this work so that's definitely a highlight for me um and the second one i would pick is our work on keep well fund um the group developed this scheme obviously in response to the pandemic um, and it was really important to them that we were as responsive as possible i.e do this as quickly as humanly possible <laughs> and also that we stuck to our values of trusting young people um, and we just we developed it at a time of real uncertainty where we were all trying to adjust to working from home and working with the group in this virtual way. Um, so it was a lot to do, but I was so proud of the group. It was bringing together all of the learning that we'd got from aspirational awards, from all the work we'd done together. And it just felt like a really strong moment of the group and working in this way can make such a big difference. That's cool. I like that adjusting to working from home and sky comes in right on cue in the sorry <laughs> that's brilliant so you can hear such, it such great timing <laughs> so i think like i mean for, for me in terms of highlights amidst all of the kind of achievements that you've mentioned the residential for me that we did back in january in 2020 really stands out because it was it was before covid or this pandemic was even on our radar and it, when I look back on it now you know I'm so grateful for that time because I think all that sort of hard work that we did together was great you know they made decisions as Sarah said they interviewed all the evaluators the potential evaluators and picked one um, they did decision making in the final round of aspirational awards um, they yeah. did work planning but also we just kind of cooked dinner together and you know sat on the couch put our slippers on got a fire on you know, I got to know them. I, I hadn't had that chance to spend that time with yeah. them yet. And, and now when I look back on it, I realise that I wouldn't have been able to do the work that I've done with them since you've gone off in mat leave had I not had those relationships built at that point in time. So it, it really does stand out um, because you, you kind of need to have spent that time with them to then be able to just pick up the phone and also to do really okay. tough work on, on Zoom together. So, I mean, co-production, it's not, it's not easy, is it? I mean, it's 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 so rewarding, but it's not easy. We have to be honest about that. So let's reflect a wee bit on that. Some of those challenges. Have you found aspects of the work to be challenging? You know, are there some difficult aspects that you would pick out? Yeah, um, I think firstly, just to agree with you, that it's the most rewarding and fulfilling role you could have. Like, I absolutely love it, um, and I feel so privileged that they let me into their group because it's very much their their space. Um, but yeah, there are challenges. And I think, for example, just in terms of the participation work, it can be lonely if there's, if there's just the one of you. So I think we realized quite early on that if one person was leading this work, that they would need some dedicated support to do it, to do it well. Um, and ideally, if resources would allow that you could have two people, um, two people there, especially at meetings, I think this is where it comes um, really important is that it sounds really obvious. But so that one person can set up all of the things that the group love about the meetings, getting their favorite snacks, putting teas and coffees, and you've got one person there who can kind of have undivided attention to catch up with the group. I think that's that's kind of really important. Um, and I'd also just say that this work also involves spinning a lot of plates and needing to be flexible and pretty comfortable with uncertainty. Um, for example, we're never quite sure who's turning up to a meeting until one hour before, and you just you just get you learn to get used to it um, but there's also no room for any egos the group will make sure that that's gone pretty quickly in the kindest way possible but yeah you have to be aware of that um, and finally I just say that another challenge is needing to push others around you to fully invest in co-production and to always have young people there 
when important decisions are being made. Um, I think it's really easy for this to feel like a luxury when time, time is against you. Um, but I think just keep reflecting on where you're at and, and where you want to be, I think is really important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was reflecting on some of the challenges. Yesterday I was in a session of Matter of Focus and I guess, you know, for me, I found it quite eye-opening when I joined the Trust because I had worked at big public bodies before and, you know, there's, I was used to kind of a lot of policies and processes, I suppose, and things taking, you know, quite a long time to happen. So I found it quite eye-opening, the pace at which things happen. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the Trust, there's safeguarding in place and, and, you know, everybody will always be kept safe, but, but we do take risks and, you know, we always kind of, when young people suggest stuff, we try to find a way to, to make that happen, you know, so we're not scared of that possibility of looking back and saying, well, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it would, but, you know, we've learned from it and let's reflect on it. So, but that takes a bit of getting used to. It's totally exhilarating, but it can also be a wee bit scary. Um, I guess, like, thinking about, you know, when I, when I first joined the Trust, I thought, wow, this stuff's incredible. We know there's so many kind of bits of gold dust out there how do we capture this you know with an evaluator and and, and an evaluation and you'll see the outputs now that you know we're going to watch the film and the evaluations published um you've been so close to this work what what kind of impact do you hope that these outputs will have yeah i know it's amazing seeing all of this come come together at this point in time um but i think in terms of impact obviously the legacy of the trust is what's up there and I think specifically getting more people to do co-production um, in this way and taking what we've learned and doing it better. And um, I think that's what the group want. That's why they're involved in this work. They want young people at the heart of decision making. So in terms of impact, that's 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 my number one. If I could be greedy and ask for more, then getting funders to fully commit to participatory participatory grant making and oh, seeing the seeing the value in investing in individual grants I think we've seen that come through time and time again so I'd, I'd really like to see that um, and I think in terms of impact just kind of touching on what Helen had said before it's really easy to dismiss the impact on us so for me just doing this work has been the highlight of my career and I think looking forward it's completely changed the way that I see myself in my own work, but also the work I want to do in the future. So I just, yeah, I want to, to make that really clear that the impact is wider than the work the group do, the impact of the group, it's for all of us. Um, so yeah, oh, and one more. One more. <laughs> in terms of the wider context for young people with care, care experience, I really hope that this helps to propel work around the promise um, and the, all the refra free, reframing work that's going on. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that last one. You know, if yeah. I mean, if you're looking for something to help challenge stigma, you know, you can't really get better than the outputs from from this evaluation. You know, and you can see the work that can happen when you sit side by side with young people with care experience. And I, I'm going to be greedy too. You know, I can honestly put my hand in my heart and say that working with the advisory groups just has been a life changing experience. And working with you too, I mean, it's without a doubt change my perspective on, on what's possible and I've learned so much from you about the pacing of things and how to time stuff and when to pick up the pace and when to slow it down so thank you so much for teaching me stuff too <laughs> Katrina um, so and also thanks for doing this in your first day back it was a total I'm pleasure so to sorry to about like the this. parking dog oh not at all it was even better having Sky <laughs> as part of it um, I do wonder though like we've thrown you back into this maybe you've had a more easier life a more easy life in the past 11 months um, so to everyone else please get in touch with us if you'd like to speak to Katrina or myself we'll put our details in the chat um, and Carol we're just going to hand back to you now Big thanks to Katriona and Mari and a special shout out to Sky the dog who was making our presence felt there. I think you'll have picked up from that chat that the personal and professional growth that comes from working in this way is huge for everyone concerned. You don't necessarily need specific qualifications. It's more about having an open mind and a willing heart. And this will be key to realising the promise for children, young people and families in Scotland in the years ahead. OK, so we're now at the moment that we've all been waiting for. I hope everyone has some popcorn at the ready. 
it's time for the world premiere of Side by Side. This film features a number of our advisory group members talking about their experiences, the impact that being part of the group has had on them and how it has influenced the wider landscape of policy and practice around care experience in Scotland. Media Co-op really embraced this film project and made sure that the advisors were centrally involved in developing and scripting the film and they also formed part of the production crew. What an amazingly talented bunch. There are also one or two guest appearances, so keep your eyes open for those. I'm going to stop talking now so you can sit back, relax and enjoy Side by Side. How do young people get the power to drive decisions that affect us? This is what we do at the Life Changes Trust. When I walked into that Edinburgh office, not knowing anybody, I didn't realise that actually five and a half years later, I would walk away with so many friends and a family. How did the Life Changes Trust advisory group come about? Our remit is to create transformational change for young people with care experience. So we were really keen to have an advisory group of people who had their own lived experience of the care system, who would work alongside us and really influence us, advise us on our work. Originally we only got given one initiative, Aspiration Awards, which then kind of snowballed into all different initiatives and then they kind of had the faith in us and trust in us to take control of and create new initiatives. Between the trust and the advisory group, who has power and makes decisions? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I am the boss, if you ask everyone, it's me. <laughs> uh, I would say we all have the power, but then the advisory group, I think, maybe just have a tad little bit more power. <laughs> We really are embedded at the start of everything. The idea, the planning, you know, the risk management, the taking it to committee, us then saying, right, what does that look like? How do we want to distribute it? Timelines, evaluation. We haven't been parachuted at the end for that photo, for that bit of promo to say, this is the advisory group. Actually, we have genuinely been through the good, the bad, the ugly. What do you get from being part of the group? I used to say I was always bossy, but now I've learned it's leadership skills. I've got good leadership skills. <laughs> Trust have put me through my housing qualification. It's not just take, take, take. Do you know how much they embrace us and they want us to do well? I know personally I've come a long way. I've done so many different things that I just wouldn't have. We went to Edinburgh to speak at the Parliament and we were in front of like, all these posh people. <laughs> And at first I felt a bit like, oh God, like, I didn't think we were like, professional enough to maybe go and speak at the Parliament because I always thought that was like very high-end, well-paid people. Like to me that was like, whoa, we've made it. <laughs> Do I get a blue tick on Twitter yet? <laughs> Sometimes you get tend to ask to like, tell your story, tell your life story. What were the reasons you were in care for? But that is something the Trust never asks us to disclose and that was something that I thought was really good because sometimes people might not want to tell their story and like I've always said like being care experienced doesn't define me who I am that was just part of the journey I had to overcome to become who I am. When I was younger participation wasn't there and I just don't know if there was a space or the mechanisms for children young people's voice to be truly kind of listen, heard, understood, acted upon and kind of implemented. I think our group has allowed kind of little Lydia to have that voice. And I think kind of within our group, little Lydia has kind of been able to have her voice heard. What do you think it was like for the staff in the Trust to work with people like us with experience of care? 
I don't really know, but because we came in like a, I was going to say a herd of elephants. I think it brought enjoyment more to the work, maybe. Having the advisors has helped us to do our work better. You bring, you know, an experience, a perspective, a knowledge that as staff members we just can't have. Really early on it became clear that we weren't going to be setting the agenda. You all came in, you had your own ideas about what you wanted to do. You challenged us, we challenged you. You know, you started to influence us across all of our ways of working. Tell us what the most surprising thing has been about working with the group. The amount of work that you guys get through, it was literally kind of nine o'clock, we're starting to design this, by 11 o'clock we'll be onto the criteria, by 12 o'clock we'll be doing the application form. You know, you're blitzing in a day and a half work that maybe as members of staff we might take a couple of months to do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges um, about making this work? I think there needs to be a level of trust and I think for me that's what relational working is all about. Once you've got that foundation, the sky's the limit really, you know, there's, there's so much that you can do together. You don't get that innovation, you don't get that fresh thinking, unless there is a bit of back and forth, a bit of disagreement. What impact do you think us as advisors had on the, the Life Changes Trust? From the outside looking in, what I'd say is there's a different, different tone around Life Changes Trust. Over the time, some of the fund's practice has probably become more deliberately inclusive, you know, using its platform to make sure that the people it works with are, are well heard. Do you think it's hard for staff to sort of give up that power? I think sometimes it's hard. I think some folk do like having power, but I also think um, some folk would give it away, but they don't know how. What was it like when we were wrestling you for power? Of course, it's hard to give up power. It's no sort of usual practice within the funding world. We believe that you do make better decisions when you involve the people that you're working with. What difference did we make? We've had a couple of staff that have never had the opportunity to work directly with people in the way that we do at the Trust. And they've described that as being life-changing for them. This is going to sound cheesy, but I'll say it anyway. I feel like I'm a better person for doing this, this work. I really do. And seeing you all um, grow in confidence and, and stature and um, see your ideas kind of come to fruition. We probably didn't really have the sense of just how, how big and how wide this could go um, and it's been a real joy to be part of that. Can you tell me what aspirational awards are? Individual grants for young people with care experience aged between 18 to 25 for an aspiration that would help them in the future. From wanting to open up their own business, to want to go and travel the world, to want to go and do volunteer opportunities. We were in charge of everything, like from the name, from how much we would allocate her award to write an application. I remember the blood, sweat, slog and tears, residential months of agony going, why are we here? What do we want to do? It's really good that being able to be trusted with like over £200,000 from the trust because being in care you tend to always get stigmatised but being able to be given £200,000 to kind of control and to determine who's getting what and how it's getting allocated was like just really strong and powerful for myself because I think if I thought 10 years ago no way would anyone trust me with over like £200,000. When we first started Aspiration Awards, people thought, oh, you're giving young people a lot of money. Like, how do you know they'll spend it? Like, how do you know they'll mark it? Right? Like, you're giving them all the power. Well, you're going to give a young person five grand. And I actually think it was a committee that says, why aren't you doing vouchers? And we says, would you give your son or daughter vouchers? No, but well, we're not giving ours either. What's good for your child is good enough for us. We are going to show them that we trust them. 
uh, when we were giving successful applicants a pack, we put something personal into the gift bags. So I think there was an applicant they wanted to go to cooking school. We went to buy like a mini whisk and we kind of wrote them a letter. We gave people the, the respect, the dignity, the love that maybe wasn't there before and we wanted to kind of say, here you go, this is for you. And I think aspirational awards is everything that we wanted maybe when we were younger. We used what we learned from Aspiration Awards and decided to create another initiative called My Choice and My Future. I'm Ian and I received an individual grant from the Life Changes Trust. So I received my grant to pursue further education and um, at that moment in time I'd kind of hit a brick wall. So when I came across Life Changes Trust, it was like, hold on a minute. There's a charity giving people help for people like me. So do you think the grant scheme would have been the same if it had been made by sort of typical professionals? If the grant scheme was made by typical professionals, I'm not sure it would have been relatable. I'm not sure it would have inspired me to apply. When I seen the application, I was like, yeah, this is something I can fill in. It most definitely spoke to me. Fast forward a couple of months later, I got the acceptance for the award and I was just overwhelmed. This is the first time in my life that I've had a chance like this. Do you think that people really understand what care experience young people are capable of? No. We can achieve amazing things, we can do amazing things, and a lot of care experienced people are, they have raw talent, and sometimes that talent isn't harnessed. That's the amazing thing about something positive like this. When someone gives you a chance, it's, it's so important, and it, it gives you that confidence. The Home and Belonging Program, yeah, it's been something special. Having a member of the advisor group, you know, assigned to our organisation to, to work as our advisor, whenever we see each other, there'll be hugs and, and whatnot. And you, you don't often get the urge to hug a lot of people associated with funders. What was the Home and Belonging Initiative? So Home and Belonging was one of our funding initiatives. It was a £4 million initiative, so it's quite a large one, about trying to discover that sense of home and belonging for young people who are ready to move on from care. Professionals and young people could apply to turn projects in potentially support accommodations, environments, more into a home environment, a safe environment for the young people that they can go to as their safe space. Right the way through, we worked with the advisory group to design the initiative, to get applications in and to make final decisions. And the two-day event was, was about that. It was about making sure that we didn't have professionals just sitting around the table uh, talking the way. They had to engage with young people, they had to create models, they had to draw diagrams, um, they had to really sort of test out the ideas that they wanted to develop. What do you think the professionals got out of it, sort of from having our support and advice and perspective? So we were in the prototyping exercise and they were speaking about this is the kitchen and this is the this is a staff room. And I says, um, why 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 does it need to be a staff room? And why can't we call that the chillax room? That's your that's where you guys go to sleep, but that's also a space in a children's house that they can go and chill out. Do you think your staff room it makes somebody feel like it's their home and they belong. He's going to go away and think that it's my work, but it is their home. And that's what we want to happen. What was the most important thing about that grant? Was it the money? Well, uh, no, no. The most important thing about the home and belonging process was the learning, the skills that I gained, the, and the processes we now have in place, you know, for supporting co-design as we go forward as an organisation. And that, yeah, that has been a massive benefit beyond the money. The facilitation, the training, the tools we got was the, what made the difference. Has that affected your work after the project? 
Uh, and as you're very pleased to say it has. As an organisation, we'll often design programmes as, prof as professionals. We would often find that in the first few months or within the first year that certain elements of that were not working. But on this occasion, we were confident from the start that this is what care experienced people would need because they've told us and they, they've designed this. So whenever we're looking at new projects or even developing part of an existing project, it's where's the co-design. Seeing advisors really taking their place and leading a lot of the activity that was happening, for us as staff, I think that felt quite a special moment. We thought, yes, this is what we've been working to. The people that you want to make the change for, they need to be involved. What are we going to do about this? Not what am I going to do about this or what are you going to do about it? It's what are we going to do? Co-production is a bit of a buzzword. Can you tell me sort of what it means to you? So it's about sharing power. It's about designing something together and being willing to, to learn and use the expertise of other people to um, arrive at a better solution. Do you think co-production is easy? No, it's really hard. And doing it well is really hard because it takes skill, it takes resilience and perseverance. So why bother do it? What is the value of co-production? If you want to solve a complicated problem, you need a lot of different perspectives on that problem. I can't think of a single funding organisation that wouldn't benefit from engaged, thoughtful conversations with people about what they do with a view to changing or adapting what they do based on what they hear. Would you say co-production is easy? I mean, the honest answer has to be no. You can't expect people just to parachute into a situation where, you know, big decisions might be getting made without having created that foundation. Um, but for us, the benefits have really kind of shown that that, that investment's so worthwhile. What it's been about really is about trying to create time and space to really get to know people. Sometimes people look at that as a bit of a luxury or feel that's not realistic to invest in that kind of way. Um, but actually, I would flip that round a little bit and say, well, what's the consequences if you don't do that? You're going to miss out enormously on what is possible. At the beginning, it can feel uncertain. If you trust the process, if you let go a little bit, that's when you can really create the space for innovation, fresh thinking, real magic. If we have shown anything is co-production works, but that recipe, it needs to kind of have everything in it. It needs to have autonomy and it needs to have mutual respect. If any other organisation was looking into co-production, what advice and hot tips would you give them? I'd say do it. Do it today. Take every chance you can to hear from the people you seek to support and work with. You can't be too scared to fail. And, you know, having that honesty of this worked but that didn't, if you don't succeed first time, that doesn't mean that you just give up. If we can do it, actually, lots of people can do it. It's not as difficult as you think it is. So yeah, just get started. Don't be afraid, be brave. When we set it up, we didn't really know what it was going to be. It's, it's, it's been wild, it's been really, really good. It's something that I hold really, really kind of close to my heart and it's the coolest thing ever. Hope you enjoyed the film. It was always going to be a challenge to capture the essence of the group and explain the impact of working in this way with lived experience guiding us. But I think the film gives a great sense of the journey that we've all been on together. Thanks again to Matter of Focus and Media Co-op for all of their work on this. When we commissioned the evaluation of the group, we had no idea a pandemic was on the horizon. Many times we wondered if it would actually be possible to make the film. So it's absolutely brilliant to be sharing it with you all today. 
It's time now for a short break, which will be for 10 minutes. So plenty of time to grab a coffee and stretch your legs. When we come back, we'll be hearing from Ian Kenji, who was a recipient of a My Choice, My Future Award, another initiative developed by the group, as you heard on the film. The group also has some top tips for anyone thinking of implementing co-production in their own organisation, and we can highly recommend that. Next up, we're going to meet Ian Kenji, who will be chatting to Mari, who you met earlier. Ian was a recipient of a My Choice, My Future Award. As you heard earlier on, My Choice, My Future was the final individual grant scheme developed by our advisors, and it drew on all the learning, really, from the previous schemes. You'll have seen Ian in the side-by-side -side film, but now he's going to tell us what he did with his award and how it's impacted on his life. So I'm just going to ask Mari and Ian to join me on screen now. Welcome to both of you, and I'll just hand over to you now. Thanks, Carol. Ian, hiya. Nice to see you. How are you doing? You're right. Good to yeah. see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, and pleasure, pleasure. So you just watched Side by Side, which you star in, you know, like a vision in all blue. Um, before we chat a wee bit about your My Choice, My Future Award, why don't we start with taking a moment, just introduce yourself and also tell me what you thought of the film. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, for, for all you guys that may or may not know, my name's Ian. Um, and yeah, um, I'm one of the, 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 the people that kind of got um, one of the awards. So it was um, a really overwhelming experience in a good way and um, and actually seeing that was actually really inspiring to be honest with you it's a really inspiring clip because um, you get to see things from both ends of the spectrum so um, it was really really great and I, I probably need time to digest all that information and um, I definitely will be going back to, to, to kind of refer that but um, it's, it's really inspired me today. Cool. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, in the film, you spoke a wee bit about your My Choice, My Future award, and there's been quite a lot happening in your life even since we filmed that back in June. So yeah. do you want to tell us a wee bit about that? And also, you know, the, the role that maybe the My Choice, My Future award played in some of that stuff that's been happening? Yeah, so um, essentially a bit about me. I mean, I've been in um, Glasgow for maybe, say, um, 19 years. I was born in Kenya and um, we had came to kind of join my stepdad and things never worked out. So kind of from when I came to the UK, it was always a bit of a, a bumpy journey. Um, and all my kind of days, I never really had that option to not be consistent and pursue opportunity. Um, but what I can say is, you know, at the, at the point in time when I'd applied for that grant, um, I was kind of at a stage where I wanted to pursue further education, you know, um, and, and kind of go on to postgraduate learning. But um, I needed some funding. I was struggling to really, you know, get the funds together. So when I had applied for um, this funding, it was it was not expecting to even get it. Um, but then I was able to get it and use that to get a postgraduate certificate. Um, and that allowed me to get an opportunity um, to actually teach and do a four year PhD in Harriet Watt. And I got and I got a lot of help and support with kind of you know trying to get that information together. But that grant really helped me to go on and achieve that opportunity. So um, now they're they're calling me Mr. Kenji, and now I have to go to lectures, and now I have like coffee and stuff like that, and briefcases, <laughs> you know. So um, it's okay. really just um, overwhelming. I can't really believe it, but it's really been like a chain of events. And if I if I never got that opportunity to be able to afford that kind of further learning, I'm not sure I'd be in this situation now. That's amazing, actually, to hear that. So you're so you're actually properly lectured, you're given lectures now, as well as being sort of funded through through the PhD, which is kind of what you were dreaming of, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was essentially, I had reached a point where I was, I, I knew now what I wanted to do in my life and um, kind of reaching this stage took a long time, which um, I think is a powerful concept in terms of opportunity and knowing where you want to go. Um, and it took me a long time to realise what I wanted to do. Then I, I, I knew that I wanted to kind of give back to academia and, and continue, um, you know, research. But I just didn't have the opportunity at the time. So um, this allowed me to obviously get that, that certificate. And then now, um, I, as I say, I teach in Harriet Watt and I lecture um, some, some lectures, some days and, you know, tutorials. And as well as that, I've got a four year funded PhD. Um, and it was actually really interesting that the first day I had actually, you know, um, started it was about September it was maybe just a couple months ago and um, I wasn't really well I'd caught COVID and then I had pneumonia so I just hopped out of hospital 92% healed still limping 
And then I, I just walked into to, to Harriet Watt and I seen this student who was so happy to be there. He looked like uh, Harry Potter who's been going to the gym. And um, he just went, it's so great to be back, isn't it? And I just thought, wow, yeah, it is. You know, even though that was my first time there. And that was like a real pinnacle moment for me. It was like a pinch yourself moment. Wow, you're here. And me and him spoke and we spoke about, you know, his upbringing and my upbringing. And it turns out he went to private school in Edinburgh. It turns out I'm just a Glaswegian boy from Pollock Shaws who's in Edinburgh. And, and um, yeah, it was really like a, a moment that was symbolic in terms of reminding me that I actually deserved that opportunity, um, which, was, which was crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, you totally do deserve it, Ian. Keep remembering that. And I'm, I'm getting a sense from you about how important and, and from conversations we've had together, how important individual grants are to young people with care experience. And for some people, you know, th that support is out there, but but they just kind of struggle to grasp it with both hands. They actually need support to, to take on the support, if you know what I mean. Mm. So it's, you know, th there's maybe things going on in their life that just make that difficult for them, or they maybe don't even know that the support's out there, that something like My Choice, My Future exists. Do you think that, you know, that support to sort of apply for these kind of things is important for young people? I, I would say so, uh, absolutely, most definitely. It's kind of the the unwritten um, agreement or, or kind of contract, I would say. It's that way where they support, but there's everything else that comes of the support, the mentoring, the guidance, the perspective, the leadership. And a lot of it is experience as well with organisations like yourself, Life Changes Trust, you have loads of experience of dealing with young people. There was also um, the organization Hub for Success who also had helped me out when I was applying. I felt out my depth um, applying for that PhD and um, I contacted the, the Hub for Success, spoke to a lady, uh, Shona McIntosh, I think she might be here as well. And um, that was an amazing moment for me as well, being able to receive that support uh, and she had had that experience. So there's charities like yourselves that really make a, a massive difference because there was one point I was, so I'd applied for the PhD, never got it. And then the the program person who was kind of interviewing me goes, Ian, I, I love your story. I would, I would love to give you more opportunities. So uh, I was kind of just stuck in limbo and I was not banking on that opportunity. And there was one point I was speaking to Shona and I said, I don't know if someone like me deserves this. And she just shut that down. You know, she just went, no, Ian, don't say that, you know? And it made me realize like, hang on a minute, she's right. That was just a really silly thought. But a lot of times when you're coming from a, a toxic environment, maybe lack of equal opportunity, your voice isn't heard, it's cancerous. And, and, and that's a strong word that I use. Uh, and you're coming from a cancerous environment. You're trying to break the mold. Nobody's given you opportunity. The people that you're surrounded with have a, maybe a defense mechanism. So you're talking all these big dreams and ambitions and it gets shut down it's difficult to kind of um, conceptualize the point, the point of what you want to do, or who you want to be, because there's just so much not smoke and mirrors and so much noise. So having that safe place uh, and having that environment and, and having those people you can have that conversation with is priceless. Um, and, and, and to all you kind of people involved in the sector and in the industry, in the third sector and obviously care experience, uh, you know, work, I can't thank, you know, you guys enough. And, and I'm actually so inspired that when people ask me, how did you get here? You're, you're awful young, you know, you're 24 and you're doing all these things. I say that, you know, there's been a, a while that I was only able to receive help, but now I'm also able to give it and I always endeavor to do so. But it, it made me realize today also watching today's clip, everybody's story is so unique and that's so special. Um, and, and, and everyone's got a story to tell. You don't really realize that your story can go on and inspire other people to go and do amazing things. So just to kind of touch upon what you said, I would absolutely agree uh, in terms of what you've said that without these facilities in place, it's very difficult for someone to be able to come out of that environment. You know, people, a lot of people are traumatized, you know, they've been mentally shafted, so to speak, and, uh, you know, coming to a situation where people can help and listen to you uh, is just priceless. That's, that's like, this is great to hear your reflections on that, Ian, and, and thanks because you are now in a position where you are giving back to, and even just being here today, we've spoken a bit in the past, and I'll just finish with this question for you. You know, young people with care experience can hold many identities, can't they? And, and actually, you know, you've said to me about how important it is to kind of see and hear from lots of different people. 
is is that something you know that that you think representation is important you know to kind of encourage and inspire and comfort people absolutely and i think the one thing about representation it comes back down to finding someone you can relate with so having that sense of belonging representation can take shape in many forms and um, so for me representation went a lot deeper than just my skin color for example you know growing up in the in the south side of glasgow at a time when it was the murder capital of europe and i didn't have a father figure we were asylum seekers and then it was like i didn't really see any black male leader that i could mentor so i had to create my own identity i was like people would say where are you from i was like i'm black legion you know because i was like if nobody's creating an identity if, if, if there's no one i can resonate with i'll be my own person but i would say diversity is key but more importantly being able to re reinvent yourself as someone who's maybe gone through a difficult experience is the most important thing so when you reinvent yourself what you're really saying is irrespective of what's happened good bad or ugly you're going to come out the other side and be who you want to be and continue to to kind of strip maybe the negative parts and take take on um the the, the fantastic parts and grow full of abundance so i would say that um that reinvention reinventing the wheel within yourself that in itself is representation because you can inspire other people the way you've reinvented yourself and they say oh if ian has came from this environment and um, you know i used to go down the corner shop with him and get chicken pakora at dino's and now he's in Harriet Watt ordering bruschetta, you know, for lunch. <laughs> and, you know, he drinks green tea now and stuff like that. You know, that in itself, just giving people that dream and hope, people that maybe can't see a way out, that reinvention. And then as a result, representation is where the magic really happens, I think. Incredible. Thanks so much, Ian. Thank you for joining us today. And I mean, everyone at the Trust, we're just so proud of you. And it's fantastic to hear your story, your reflections on, on the power of individual grants. Um, we commissioned the lines between to capture quite a wide range of personal stories from My Choice, My Future, and these are all available on the website. But we thought it'd be interesting to share some of the stories with our advisors as well, because it's important for them to see the impact that the initiatives that they've developed, the impact that they've had. So we recorded three of our advisors, Jack, Lydia and Saffron, and each had a story read to them by one of our staff. And we're featuring one of those recordings today, but all three of them will be available on the website. So, so give them a wee watch, they're, they're so good. Today, we're going to hear Lydia's response to Jessica's story as read to her by my colleague, Celeste. So thanks again, Ian. Hi, my name is Lydia Banks. I am a member of the Life Changes Trust Advisory Group. So I'm Celeste Berto. I'm an Evidence and Influencing Coordinator for the Life Changes Trust uh, Young People with Care Experience Program. And today I'm going to tell you, Lydia, I'm going to tell you uh, a story of one of our My Choice, My Future awardees. And I'm going to tell you Jessica's story. Now, Jessica used her My Choice, My Future award to pay for beauty therapy training courses and hair and nail supplies to start her own beauty business. And this is not her entire story, uh, which you'll be able to see kind of we have an accompanying report, but these are kind of excerpts of her story in her own words. I'm 20 years old, I live in Glasgow, and I'm an admin assistant at the moment. In my spare time, I like to do nails, I like to do hair, I just really the whole beauty scene is for me to me beauty has always been something that everybody partakes in and can cheer anyone up i love seeing people be their true selves and love their own image and i like to be the one to help to do that because it makes you feel a bit powerful like a magician so that's what i really love about beauty i think this award was going to be the one thing that could push me to really take it seriously and really focus and concentrate on doing it and doing it well i think that pushed me to want to apply because it felt like another level up, a step closer to something bigger than what I was doing already. The application process gave me a lot of cause to think, like, what are my plans for the future? Where do I actually see this going? I also had to think about the business management side, actually making myself knowledgeable about taxes, about self-employment. So when you're asking for that kind of money, it really came into thinking, like, I really need a step-by-step -step plan and I need to work everything out. I applied for supplies, products, and money to attend courses to do hair and to do nails. So within that, the hair would be wigs because I know in the black community, not just even in the black community, but in all communities that wigs are quite in style right now. 
a lot of people wear them. I wear them. So I really wanted to know how to make them and customize them. Before, I wasn't taking any nail clients. I was just doing my friends. Now I'm taking clients because I feel like I'm skilled enough to be doing that and to start making money from it. I was so shy to take people's money before. I just didn't think I was good enough. But now I know I'm good enough. So yeah, give me the money. And now this is the right time for it. Being able to start taking clients and getting my social media up to point, it's really good. It's really made me think, where do I see myself taking this? And I've actually discovered that I'd like to own a shop. I build it up from the ground up. I want to get a position. I want to get to a position where I own a nail shop and there are other girls and I can give other care experience people opportunities to work at reception or to train or things like that. It's just working out how to do that, which would be expanding on my business and administration qualifications and taking more training courses to do with that. That's the big picture plan. Having my own shop is where I see this going. Growing up, not just in Glasgow, but in Scotland as a whole, because I've lived everywhere, Fife, Perth, Edinburgh, I've never seen a hair salon owned by a black person. I've never been able to walk into town and walk into a shop and be like, can you do my hair for me? They don't do my hair and they can't cater to that. They don't know how to do it. I've had my hair done in people's sheds, in people's kitchens, and I feel like these women are really talented in what they do. I wish I could do something to give all these hairdressers a bit more light because they are really good. You should see some of the things that they do. And just because they don't have the money or they've not had the qualifications or they've come from different countries, they've not had the opportunities or assistance to be able to build a business from something that they are very good at. Now they're doing hair in their kitchen as a side thing. I don't like that. It really does make me sad. I think that it, seemed, it speaks to something more systemic because I feel like it's 2021. I should be able to walk into the city center and see at least three black hair shops that people can go to. It should just be a day-to-day -day thing, walking down the street. You've got that salon. You can just walk into and be like, hi, can you do my hair? Yes, I can. Just for other Black girls growing up to see people who look like them doing things that they enjoy, going to a shop where they don't feel like they are the odd one out. It would have been amazing for my carers or my unit staff to know a bit more about Black hair. I've had carers that have shaved my head because they've not known what to do with my hair. Having more representation would have been nice in moments like that. I really just want to expand the knowledge on black hair. Doing the whole wig thing and making that a bit more destigmatized was something quite big for me because I remember being in school and getting my first weave and because I've gone from having an afro to having long hair, the boys are like, oh, that's a wig and laughing at it. But I'm just like, you need to understand black history and the things that we do with our hair. Growing up in the care system, I never had family. I didn't have parents who, that would come on Christmas day or on my birthday or give me things. You have 80 pounds for Christmas. That's all you have for yourself. And your friends are all talking about iPhones. My parents aren't gonna buy me all that. I've not got anyone. I've been working since I was 12. I lied about my age to get a salon job because I wanted to have the same things my friends had. So to, I think to give us this, it's extremely important. It makes us feel like the tables are sort of leveling up a bit. This has given us an opportunity to do something, to be something better, to start something great. We don't all have money. We don't all have spare cash to actually do the things that we enjoy. We get so little. So to be finally given something like this is, wow, it will definitely be something I remember my whole life because it's kicked off everything. They're definitely doing magic work there, giving people opportunities like that. So, so we have this, this young woman who wants to now run her own shop. I know, <laughs> I know. Oh my God. So what do you, what do you? Well, I think that's a really emotive for kind of twofold. I think it's really emotive because, you know, I, I've, you hear the aspiration, you hear the passion, you hear the dedication. And I think, you know, that's really good as well that, we've the way that we've structured the application it's allowed her to think about what she wants and actually you know that's allowed her to give that space i think hearing those kind of steps of the impact that 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 you know somebody giving her the chance listening hearing and um, i think that is what we want to do we want to listen and hear and aspire um care especially young people at whatever level that looks like um 
And I think, you know, culturally, we're always really mindful of how do we remove barriers, but how do we include everybody? Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you're, you're already on a back foot when you're care experienced. Um, you know, people, are, you know, they don't have knowledge, you know, you're usually just a bad kid. But I just think, you know, that something that's been quite a negative um, process or kind of journey for her, that she's turned that into something positive. And I think that's really, really strong in regards to actually how do we as organisations and services not just inform ourselves of, you know, care experience young people and, you know, what they need, but I think it's that cultural and actually being given respect and dignity in all ways and actually people being person centred and caring. I think that's really, really emotive, um, you know, and not, I think that's a great, you know, I should be able to walk into the city. Of course we should, we should be able to do that. And, I, you know, I think that's, that's such a, an amazing pioneer for a culture, you know, um, and the, the confidence and, you know, I, I can't wait to see our shops. Um, I think it's amazing to know that we are helping people not just change their self, but their, their lives and actually the country and the community in which we live in and actually being able to be a platform for getting that message out because for us as a group, we didn't know that. Um, so yeah, I think that's really, really powerful, very emotive, very emotive. But thank you, thank you for sharing that, it was amazing to hear, it really, really was. But yeah, I look forward to your three shops or if you ever come to Dundee. The My Choice, My Future personal stories are so impactful. I really hope you will take the time to check them out. They demonstrate that the benefits of individual grants go far beyond the practical benefits of having a personal budget. And Ian talked very powerfully about that. It's the wider impacts on confidence, self-belief, inclusion and aspiration that are enormous. Many thanks to Lydia and Celeste for that recording. So we're nearly at the end of the webinar today, but before we go, the advisory group wanted to share some top tips for co-production based on their own experiences. They talked through their eight top tips and gave some very sound practical advice about how to co-produce authentically and impactfully. The full film of this will be on our website soon, but we thought we'd give you a wee taster. So here are our top tips. Top tip number one, to build and maintain relationships. If you actually have good relationships, your outcomes are noticeably better. They're, they're kind of pivotal to making things work. It can be small things like making sure that you're being quite consistent, that you're sort of regularly spending time offering your support. We've had socials as well where we'll, we'll actually have a work meeting and then we'll go out and we'll get dinner and we'll all sit together um, and we'll chat over what's what's been going on. Again, it's that sort of mixing of personal and business. And I think that's that's probably been kind of the secret. It's a it's a unique environment where I actually work alongside quite a few of my friends. You know, they started out as strangers, but I've come to really value each one of them in different ways. Top tip number two: prioritize shared values. I think it was really clear that we wanted to get that right. That was our foundation and that was really how we cemented not just, you know, aspirational awards, but the group. You know, that was kind of our first footing of what are you here for? What am I here for? And actually through those discussions, we all, it was very clear very soon that we were all on the same page. You know, we wanted to make change, we wanted to make care experience young people at the heart of service design, service delivery, but also their voices being heard. Top tip number three is be flexible. So we had a lot of meetings that were 
evenings and weekends and worked around people's jobs and people's study um, and the trust were always willing and able to make the time and the space for that flexibility. I think even just at the start being flexible and taking the time and understanding that there needed to be some space for people to build relationships and it's empowering them to engage in, in the way that works best for them. Top tip number four, invest in co-production. For us at The Trust, this has meant a number of different things. We've invested in a, a dedicated staff role, so a main point of contact for the advisory group who gets to know group members on a personal as well as a professional basis. But we don't just rely on that one person. You know, everyone in The Trust will have their own relationship with the advisory group, and that includes our, our trustees as well. We've also taken the opportunity to employ our advisors directly when opportunities have presented themselves. For example, to help us to assess grant applications or to make decisions about tenders for external evaluations. And we've invested in group members' personal and professional development in the same way as we do with our staff team. So it's really about valuing people's expertise, their time, their experience, and seeing them as very much part of the wider team at the Trust. Top tip number five, be ambitious together. There will be some bumps in the road and, and you'll almost certainly do some things that you'll not do again. But those tricky moments will be far outweighed by the things that you'll be proud of and amazed by. The group have assessed hundreds of applications and as a result of their decision making, more than £600,000 has been awarded directly to young people with care experience. I mean, that's incredible. Our confidence and our ambition has grown with each project and task that advisors have completed. To use their words, we just know that they'll smash it every time. Top tip number six, share power. Some charities consult, but what's really good about what we've done in terms of sharing power is we're kind of measuring things differently. If you have the parameters of what makes a good programme set by the people that have lived experience, you're going to achieve better outcomes for people. You're going to actually produce real, meaningful, tangible results which change people's lives. Top tip number seven, take time to reflect and learn. Planning in time for reflection is so important because it's really easy for that to get pushed when we get busy. I think the fact that they took that time really allowed the group to think carefully about what worked well and what could be changed to make things more equitable or accessible. They revisited the application process after each round of funding and they made some key changes in their approach, like increasing the age range, accepting telephone applications, and collaborating with staff at different organizations that support people who may face additional barriers to applying. And these things made a really big difference. Top tip number eight, have fun together. Woo! Love it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <so awesome. laughs> Our very first session was we went to the bingo. I think it was the bingo, the bingo in Springfield Key and we just had a laugh and just kind of, kind of got to know each other. So we kind of knew like who exactly was in the group. I think just spending time with everyone and getting to know everyone and like with Lation is just, it's like they weren't just like, I suppose professionals and we were the young people like we kind of were equal we kind of became like a wee family and like having a laugh and stuff So we're now at the end of today's webinar. It's been brilliant and a little bit emotional to chair this event because it's such a milestone for us at the Trust. And we've been blown away as always by the work, the commitment, the energy, enthusiasm and sheer brilliance of the advisory group. We're very grateful to each and every one of you, past and present. It's been an incredible experience to have you all as part of the Trust team. As the trust moves into its final months, it's important to say that this is the end of the chapter, but not of the story. The trust experience has shown that it's possible to invest in relational working, putting lived experience at the heart of your organisation, and the advisory group have been a, sport, a source of inspiration for many. 
interest in working in this way, whether you call it co-production, co-design, or led by lived experience, is growing. And the advisory group would like to encourage everyone here today to go away and think about actions that you can take to bring lived experience into your work. If you're already doing it, think about how you capture your learning and share it with others. For funders, the reality is that engaging with people and communities deeply leads to better decisions. The funding community could do better on co-production. We need to move from interest to action. The trust resources will be available for everyone who has an open mind and a willing heart to embrace that action. The advisors are currently supporting legacy work funded by the trust, our young funders projects, for example, sharing their knowledge of developing individual grants programmes with people with lived experience. They've also inspired other legacy developments, such as the National Leadership Network. At the Trust, we often talk about the power of ripple effects, and the advisory group have probably created waves rather than ripples. These waves will continue to build and strengthen in the years ahead. I'd just like to finish by saying thank you to everyone who gave their time to make this event possible. I hope you've loved it as much as I have. We'll email everyone with a link to the recording of the webinar in a few days, and you'll also see it on our social media channels. Please do share it with your colleagues and your friends. And finally, thank you all for supporting today's webinar, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. We really appreciate the support. Thank you so much.